الفقهاء. So بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن وراء السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. I want to first of all uh, let everyone know that I appreciate your patience and my sincere apologies again for for trying to log on and not able to log on and I, I really feel um, actually very stressed and upset that I wasn't able to be on time um, and technology sometimes brings that frustration but bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man wala um, alhamdulillah it's a blessing to be here with so many people and an honor and certainly um, a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're able to be present as a present alhamdulillah and I thought that the theme of this short reminder should be living right in in a wrong time or in a wrong world you know um, these are incredible times and they are very difficult and, and they are stressful but we as as Muslims we look at things very differently we see things through a different lens and we learn this from Sholta Kaf the 18th chapter of the Quran the reason that perhaps we are informed and taught to read it every Friday is that one of its major themes is that we have to see through the material world. That's why it's called tadabbur, the tadabbur of the Quran to give you a better understanding, dubur is the back of a person. So when I make tadabbur, it is as though I'm moving beyond the shallow meaning of something. I think all the way through it and then I reach the backside of it. So I've gone completely through something. And that's the opposite of the current climate that we live in where financial gain is based on keeping people shallow. And that's one of the responses to people that attack Islam and say that Islam is for perhaps the mother of bad ideas. The problem is in Islam, the problem is Muslims, we have to engage our texts in a way where we think through it. Allah says, will they not make tadabur of the Qur'an? We're challenged to think through the Qur'an till we come out the other side, subhanAllah. And when we look at Surah Al-Kaf, if we think deeply, there is a very powerful theme. And that is the theme of how to live right during wrong times. And the first is to posit the material world as a means and not a goal. And to understand that uncomfortability and challenge is a natural outcome of the material world. Because if it wasn't, there would be no need for Jannah. Allah says, Wallahu yada'u ila dari salam. Allah calls us to dar salam, which is Jannah. Innama mathalul hayati dunya. The example of the temporary world is like rain that falls. It, it, it brings about a sense of glitz for a minute, but then as mentioned in Sultan Hadid, it begins to slowly erode and there's nothing left. And we see that that creates an important quality that helps us live right in wrong times. And that's the quality of sacrifice. Because when I sacrifice the material world for the hereafter, I lose nothing. When I sacrifice the delights and comforts which go beyond just the basic necessities. I'm talking here about falling into the cult of opulence. The more that I sacrifice for the hereafter, as long as it doesn't hurt others, the more I gain. So with that attitude, the cave becomes a mansion and a mansion becomes the cave. And that's why those young people are able to sacrifice their social utility, their material utility and benefit, their names, their prestige, are all sacrificed for Allah. Allah says, وَرَبَتَنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ إِذْ قَامُوا And when they took that step of sacrifice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we made rabt of their hearts. We nodded their hearts on sound principles. And that's why we find the Sahaba in moments of poverty are still very generous. They, they prefer others to themselves, even though they have a need. The early foundations of Islam were built on the backs of men and women who are not scared to sacrifice. The contemporary material world 
And even Islam in America, as it's been conditioned by Islamophobia, is one which dangerously te teeters towards acceptance and comfortability, getting likes. Whereas living right in wrong time demands that I sacrifice things and that I give up things. And I see that through the sacrifice is ultimate gain. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha said, I gave away most of the meat and I kept a little for us. And he said to her, what you kept is what we lost and what you gave is what we earned. SubhanAllah. The second lesson that we learn is that we should not be deceived by the glitz of this world. And we have to be very, very mindful of a global monoculture which is largely curated through things like TikTok and Instagram, and even in the academy, certain assumptions found in the academy, there is a global monoculture. And one of the challenges of that monoculture is that it reminds us that the more you have, the better you are. The more you have, the better you are. Religion and religious morals and values takes a very diff different stance on this issue. It is whatever you have, the more you are, as long as you are tying what you have to a greater purpose and committed to living your life, no matter what you have, no matter the wealth, no matter the poverty, no matter what you have, if you're committed, this can only happen in New York, mashallah, you're committed to living right. And that's why when someone came to Sayyidina Imam Ahmed and asked him if I was a millionaire, can I be righteous? He said, yes, as long as it's in your hand and not in your hearts, meaning you're using it for the right reasons. We also know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned the blessings and benefits of utilizing what we have for Allah. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, khayrukum, the best of you are those that Allah has given kafafa, sufficient means, and he or she employs that sufficient means in the proper way. So we see in Surah Kaf the lesson of the garden and these two men, and that's really the theme of Surah Kaf is balancing the material world when it comes to possessions, when it comes to knowledge, Sayyidina Musa, when it comes to political power. The story of Sayyidina Dhul Qurnay, which is an example of good power. Why, when you entered your garden, didn't you recognize that this was a blessing from Allah? That man that was given that wonderful garden allowed his efficacy in this world to blind him from the hereafter. I don't think that this will ever end. The second lesson is our lesson with knowledge. A third is our lesson with knowledge. Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu was salam. Who in the kalan tastati amaya sabara wa kaifa tasbiru ala madam to hit bihi khubara. How can you be patient with what you don't know? Qada said tajiduni insha'Allah. Sabira wala a'si laka amra. Humility. You know, one of my friends recently we were talking, he said that humility is on the endangered species list. Like it's very rare to find someone say like, I don't know, can you help me? Can you teach me? Because one of the, the outcomes of the self-help era towards the end of the 90s is the lack of respect for scholarship and specialization. Everybody knows. But we have a great lesson that Sayyidina Musa when he is confronted with the fact he doesn't know, it doesn't spark his ego, it sparks his interest. It doesn't cause him to react cathartically in an angry way. No, he embraces the fact And that's why in the Quran, if you pay attention in Arabi, there is the sense that knowledge is endless. That's why usually knowledge appears in the indefinite article. As if to say there is no way to define knowledge. Knowledge is endless. So you're going to constantly be searching for new things and learning new things. One time I was traveling with my teacher years ago in Qatar 
And his father was almost 100 years old in Senegal. And his father called him, and I heard his father telling him, like, barking directions to him, right? And then the sheikh, he said, we have to go, we have to go, we have to go, we have to go to this bookstore. So he found this bookstore, and he bought this book. And I said, man, what happened? He's like, my father was telling me that I need to buy this book on Islamic economics and the environment. And I was like, you know, I was 20. I was like, sheikh, like, your father is 99 years old. Doesn't he know everything at this age? He's like, he's still thirsty to learn something new. He's still thirsty to learn something new. The last is power. And as we enter into now the last few weeks before the election, we see how power can be used for good and bad. And as a Muslim community, we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, يُذِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيُعِزُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ تُؤْتِ الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ You give power to who you want, you take power from who you want. But we learn from Sulta Kaf that one of the crucial qualities of living right in a wrong time is to try to acquire power. As Sayyid Ibn Musayyib said, there's no good in someone who doesn't acquire enough wealth to protect themselves. As Sufyan al Tawri said, Al Mal Silahatul Mu'min, that wealth is the weapon of the believer. But to make sure that we use power right and that as we have access to power, we don't sell out. We don't forget the plight of people who need help. We don't leave people behind. So we learn from Sol Tukav four foundational principles that help, help us live right in wrong times. Number one is sacrifice. Number two is that material gain untethered from morality and ethics is useless. Number three, the importance of being hungry and thirsty for knowledge and humble with all people. Imam Madik once was walking with his students and they came across a simple man in the desert who was like a shepherd. And Imam Malik said, that's my sheikh. And they said, how can that be your sheikh? You're Imam Malik. This guy's just a shepherd. He said, that man, he taught me the fiqh of the dogs. So what do you mean? He said, when I was a student, I had trouble discerning between an adult dog and a, and a puppy. And this man, he told me that if the dog can raise its leg when it relieves itself, it's an adult. If it can't, it's still considered a puppy. So he said, Hada Shaykhi. That's my teacher. Now it's the opposite. We're not only arrogant with people who we deem as being underqualified, but we find a great bravado and sense of accomplishment by destroying and attacking the people who are specialized in subjects. And that's a disaster. A few days ago, I was, I was in CVS, and whether someone agrees with it or not is not the point. And I saw someone arguing with the pharmacist about the flu shot. And he was yelling at the pharmacist, saying that the flu shot causes more illness and is not healthy during COVID-19. And the pharmacist was trying to politely explain to the person that this is not a peer-reviewed position, nor is it supported by any empirical data. And this man lost it and began to cuss the pharmacist out. Like, was it really worth your day to cuss out a stranger that you don't even know? Like, in many ways, the monoculture of online life has just contributed and put more wood into the fire of our own sense of hubris and arrogance. One of my teachers said, no one likes to tell themselves anything more than I know, I know. And this was why some of the Sufis said, be careful of the word I, because I is the word of shaitan. I'm better than him. What we call anania. So knowledge is something we should respect. Even if we don't agree with a person's contention, we have a method that we see in Sayyidina Musa's questioning with the people of knowledge. And then finally is power. And as we move into the last few weeks before the election, as I mentioned, thinking about how we need to work to scale power, to create opportunities for power in the Muslim community, and then to make sure that we employ that power in a way which is just, Allah said to say to Muhammad, فَحْكُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْعَدْلِ Right? Use your power to judge between them in justice. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you wa wa iyakum. 
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you with my apologies. I'm giving the reminder in a car. It wasn't my plan. I hope that I haven't offended any of you. Um, but the struggle sometimes is real. But I appreciate your presence. I'm thankful that you're listening. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us live right in wrong times. The Prophet said, Ibadatun fil fitna, worshiping Allah during times of fitna, kahijrati ilay, is like migrating to the Prophet. And living right in wrong times, the Prophet mentioned that someone who does right in wrong times in an authentic hadith, their good will be magnified 700 times more. So the believer doesn't let the times bring them down. They see this as an opportunity. SubhanAllah, to take advantage of living in wrong times because we get more reward for it, alhamdulillah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we turn to Allah as the fuqara to Allah. Oh Allah, we turn to you admitting our faqr to you that you enrich us with iman. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our brothers and sisters in Nigeria who are now in a struggle for basic human rights. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Pakistan, in Kashmir, in Chechnya. We pray for our brother Khabib. We ask Allah to give him victory, inshallah, and he will continue to use him, inshallah, in a positive way to spread the message of Islam, our brother Habib. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our sisters who are struggling and trying to make ends meet in the crisis of COVID-19 and have children. You know, we have sisters in New York City who live in shelters, man. They live in shelters with their children. So we ask Allah to bless them and to strengthen them. We ask our community to be able to scale and create power in a way as we see now that, mashallah, domestic shelter was just purchased that we're able to serve people. We pray for our brothers and sisters in the Congo. There's a lot of things happen in the Congo that are not talked about now. You should do research and study and check it out if you don't know. We pray for our students. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist you and bless you. The resilience of our students that I see amongst the students in my classes, even though they're faced with this very difficult pandemic are very passionate and hungry for education. May Allah put barakah in that. We pray for the entire community and our imams and leadership. We ask Allah to give them tawfiq. Fajazakam Allahu khairan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Wa barakallahu feekum. Wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.